Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, warm welcome to church this morning. It's lovely to see you. Uh, and however your week's been, however you are, uh, it's wonderful to be able to gather together to support one another, to encourage one another, and also to point each other uh, to God. Uh, this morning we are starting our Advent series. We started our Advent series for the evening last Sunday, um, but this morning we're starting it in the morning, in the morning services, and we're going to be working our way through uh, the first few verses of John between now and Christmas Eve, which isn't that far away. Did you know? That? That's very exciting. Uh, so as we begin, I want to pray, and I want us. We're going to pray that we get to uh, see Jesus and see the beauty of the incarnation in a fresh and inspiring way uh, this Christmas. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we are able to gather together this morning. We thank you that, we're, that we gather knowing that you are here with us. And we gather to, to praise you and thank you for who you are and what you've done. And especially for the wonderful news that we celebrate at Christmas, that you sent your son into the world. The Lord Jesus was born fully God and fully man. And that he came to seek and to save the lost. Father, we praise you uh, for this wonderful news and we pray that you would help us this morning as we uh, celebrate and uh, begin to celebrate Advent and celebrate Christmas. We pray that you would be with us and help us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to uh, stand and sing our first hymn, which is At the Name of Jesus. We'll stand as the music starts and the words will be on the screen behind me.
Now, did anyone notice something different about the front here? I'm going to ask Alistair because I'm sure it'll be a cheeky answer. Yes? Oh, well done. I was sure he was going to go, uh, there's a tree. Because <laughs> you would have known that that wasn't the point. But there is a tree, but there are also toys. Uh, we've been announcing for the last few weeks that this was going to be our gift Sunday. And it's just a time at Christmas, at uh, the start of December, we give uh, gifts so that they can then be distributed to kids who otherwise uh, might not get gifts or might not get as much as their friends. Um, this year, just like last year, it's going to be given uh, to the toy drive at the school, at Clyde Primary. There's a, a lady who, who works for the school to, I suppose, care for, for families that are finding life tough, um, and she organises this uh, toy drive so that the, they can be distributed to the kids in Yoker uh, who need them most. Um, and so thank you very much for those who brought them along. Um, it's wonderful to, to see them, and you can think of each one uh, going to a different uh, child and, and hopefully they'll be delighted with it. Um, as, as we just think about that, let's pray. Uh, pray for those children, pray for these gifts um, and pray for God's blessing. Let's pray. Um, Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for Christmas. We thank you for a time of year set aside uh, to celebrate the birth of your son. And we thank you that in our culture people still want to celebrate Christmas. And I, I thank you, Father, that people even look to it as a time of light in the midst of the darkness. And they just don't know the extent of that light, the wonder of the coming of the Son of God. Um, but yet we still thank you that we do want to celebrate as a culture. And I, I pray, Father, for, for those in our community who will find Christmas particularly difficult because they're sad, uh, because they're struggling, and they feel that everybody else is having a good time, and they're not. Uh, Father, we ask that you would help them uh, to find their comfort, their home, their rest, uh, their joy in you. And we also pray, Father, for these gifts. We thank you for the school uh, wanting to do this, um, to try and help families that are struggling uh, this year. And I pray, Father, that you would uh, help Joanne as she distributes these, uh, help her as she supports different families. And I pray, Lord, that, um, that you would use these gifts in a small way uh, to bring joy uh, to families. So, Father, we commit ourselves into your hands. We ask that you would help us uh, as we celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus. Help us as we speak to people around, uh, our neighbours and, and folk around, that we would always be pointing not to how wonderful it is to have a tree or how wonderful it is to have uh, presents, but uh, pointing to the true gift of Christmas, the Lord Jesus. Uh, Father, please uh, help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I wanted to do... So you know how sometimes we do the notices uh, once you guys have gone out to Sunday school and sometimes after. But last week, Ewan announced that we were going to be thinking about the church name at the, the church meeting. And I thought if you'd heard that and then don't hear anything else about it, you'd be like, what's going on? And it would be unfair if you were out at Sunday school. So it was just to let you know that we discussed it at the church meeting and we felt like actually it was too big a, a palaver, too big a change. Um, and people, some people weren't sure that it was the right thing. So we decided uh, that we weren't going to try and change the church name at the moment. So that's, uh, it was just to let you know that. If you weren't here last week, you might be thinking, what's going on? Um, but that's okay. Uh, I can't remember. Some of the suggestions from the children were particularly special, so you can ask them afterwards what they thought it should be called. Uh, the other things, just to mention that we have tea and coffee after the service. If you're able to stay, please, please do. Uh, it's important to meet together to sing. It's important to meet together to pray. It's important to meet together to listen to the word read and preached. It's also important to meet together to talk to each other. Uh, to comfort one another, encourage one another, rebuke one another, and to point each other uh, to Jesus. And tea and coffee is set aside as a, a time for that. Uh, also this evening, if you're able to come back for our 5 p.m. service, uh, please do. We're going to be looking at Psalm 111, beautiful psalm that just extols God for all that he is and all that he's done and all that he's told us. Um, and so please come along. And then there's the meal afterwards, again, as a time for us to get to know each other, uh, develop relationships, and minister to one another too. Um, the weekly sheet, hopefully you picked one up as you came in. If not, grab one on your way out. It tells you all the different uh, things that are on this week. And to mention a couple of things particularly, the first is uh, on Tuesday, the women's meeting is on. Uh, it's not wrong that the women's meeting is on, but it's not the Christmas party in Harry Malloy uh, this Tuesday. Um, it's Nan Shields' William Cawson 
and William Blair, it says here, I think, otherwise known as Bill. Uh, so it was just to let you know of that um, correction. And then also to mention the church open day, which I think has the wrong times on here. It's 11 till 2, isn't it? Yeah. On here it says 11 till 4. Maybe Janice is just making provision for you to stay and help with the clean-up afterwards. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the open day itself will be uh, on from 11 uh, till 2. If you're able to help at that, the table's out there with the sign-up sheet. Remember, if you want to make you and Joyful, you sign the bottom right-hand one that says, I'm happy to go wherever. Uh, but there's all the other bits of paper if there's a job that you would like to do that would suit your gifts. Um, and also, just to mention, if you are helping, then please do come along a wee bit early for the, the setup and make sure that your thing is is set up whatever you're responsible for and please do make time at the end to stay afterwards because if everybody goes home there's a lot to do for for a few so if you can uh, think past two o'clock that you're going to stay uh, for the clear up that'd be great um, I think everything else is on the sheet um, if you uh, read it I won't intimate it particularly okay now what have we been learning over the last few weeks about God anyone else apart from Matu? Joanne, you know. What have we been learning? Yeah, what God can't do. And by implication, or alongside that, what God can do. Because actually the things that God can do means that there's some things that he can't do. Um, And we've been going through different things. So like we would think, uh, God is eternal. God will live forever. He always has been and he always will be. That's the positive thing to say. But then the other side of that is that God can't (coughs) die. God can't die. So there's lots of things that God is. It's a bad cough, lad. There's lots of things that God is and and what he can do, and we celebrate that so often, but it's important sometimes to think about things that God can't do and to glory in that. And this next one, they're all good, but I think this one might be my favorite. It's definitely my favorite just now. Do you know that God can't lie? He cannot lie. God is truth. He is always true. Everything he says is always true. He cannot lie. Hands up if you can't lie. Zion. (laughs) Was that just making my point? You can lie, can't you? You can lie. Hands up if you think you've never lied. Hands up if you know that you've told a lie. Um, Eliza's the only one with her hand down because she's not started talking enough yet. Um, But we all lie, don't we? And when someone tells you that they'll do something, when someone tells you that they do something, you, you're kind of thinking, can I trust them? Is this true? Will they? I was gonna, do you know that I was planning to tell a story against my dad this morning? And then he's here! <laughs> my dad is a wonderful dad, and he always has been a wonderful dad. <laughs> And he always wanted to give us what we wanted, me and my wee sister. He always, and he always thought, I'll be able to do that. But he worked really, really hard, and he often uh, couldn't follow through on what he had promised or said that he was going to do. Is that fair? Yeah. He did do a lot of amazing stuff with us. But I remember my wee sister running through to me, going, you'll never guess what! Dad promised that he's going to take us to... I can't remember where. And I went, I. <laughs> and I was about 11 and I was like he might because <laughs> he always wanted to but sometimes it wasn't within his power and that's the thing and I do the same with my kids I will, I'll, I'll promise things and I'll say it. and I try always to say as long as I'm able to I will because you don't know what's coming do you you don't know what might get in the way you don't know what might stop you from being able to do the thing that even in your heart of hearts you really wanted to do you meant it when you promised it but the beautiful thing about God is that he is in complete control he knows the end from the beginning not only that all of his res- all all of everything are his resources he, he is able to draw on everything everything he is all powerful there is nothing that can stop him from carrying out what he has promised and so, that's, so nothing from outside can get in the way. But sometimes you tell lies as well where actually you know fine well that you're not going to. Would you tidy your room once that program's finished? I know bother, Mum. 
Aye. I think I, I might be responsible for that one in, in return <laughs> to my dad. But you, you just, we tell lies sometimes because we think, oh, I can actually dodge this. And those lies aren't because we're not strong enough. It's because actually we're not good enough. Because actually we're tempted to tell lies. But God is all-powerful and God is all-good. Which means that nothing can stop him from carrying out his promises. Nothing can thwart it. Now, I want to think about the way that you make promises. So we put it up. Do you make promises? Yes. I will tidy my room. Excellent. How do you, if you were talking to one of your friends and you wanted to say, I really, really, really promise, would you ever do a pinky promise? Have you ever done that? Do kids still do that? You link pinkies. I'm not sure why. But you link pinkies and you go, I promise. Pinky promise. It's solid. Yeah, I saw that one as well. The thumb. <laughs> don't know what that's about either. But we make promises and we say, right, this is a symbol, a sign that my promise is sure and sound. Okay? Otherwise, you might remember, if you've ever been to a wedding, that the, the husband and wife gave each other a ring. Often that's what people do. They give each other a ring and they put it on their finger and they say, I promise, with this ring, I promise to be your husband or to be your wife for the rest of our days and to love you always and forsake all others and give you this ring as part of the promise. Or, if you were an important businessman, I don't think I've ever done this, uh, but you shake hands to confirm. It used to be in Britain that that was seen as a con binding contract. Shake on it, sir. Yeah? And it, word is my bond and a, a shake symbolizes it. Or... This is a new thing. Well, I think it's a new thing. I only came across it in the last few years. People sometimes make promises to each other and go somewhere beautiful, often overlooking water, and they'll take a padlock with them and they'll padlock it onto a fence. Is it Hands up if you've heard of this. Oh, I. Right? <laughs> Not niche. Right? And they padlock the... Hands up if you've ever done it. No. See, I don't know who these people are, but there's loads of padlocks about around the place. Right? And you put the padlock on and you say, that padlock is fixed to that and so is my promise to you, fixed and solid. Okay? There's all these different things. Now, what could God call upon? Because I wanted to read you a wee bit from uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Maybe just the first slide to start with. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6. And it says, there, people swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. So that's what those things are. Pinky promise, padlock, ring. It's, an, it's part of an oath. It's saying, I'm giving you this extra thing to confirm my promise. But then in this passage in, in Hebrews 6, we're told about God making a promise to Abraham and saying that he wanted to confirm it by making an extra, uh, an extra bit to the promise. But what's greater than God? What's more secure than God? Nothing. Nothing at all. And so listen to what God did. It goes on saying, uh, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we would have, sorry, we, would, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. So God actually swore... Oh, I didn't read the start bit, which was the context. So the bit was that God swore by himself that he would do it. He said, I promise, and I swear by myself, by my own name, that I will do it. And it says so that by two unchangeable things, it would be solid. Can anyone spot the two unchangeable things? So give me one of them. Well, so it's impossible for God to lie, but that's only one thing. Yeah? So it's... <laughs> I know. I've got a wee bit mixed up. I'm sorry. Let's go back a wee bit. So let me read the first bit. It's not on the screen. Just listen to this. It says, When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. So he wanted to, to promise, and he, he, we couldn't swear on something greater than himself, so he swore on himself. 
And so the two unchangeable things is that God, it's impossible for God to lie. Twice. Because God said, I'll give you many descendants. And then he said, and I promise by myself. And I don't change and I don't lie. And therefore it's confirmed twice. And it's just fun because I think often we say a promise and then we confirm it with another thing. But actually there was nothing extra for God to confirm it with. And so in some ways he multiplied uh, eter- eternity or infiniteness by infiniteness. He said, I promise by my name and I promise by my covenant. I promise by my, uh, my word. And both of those things don't change because God cannot lie. And that is wonderful news for us because it then goes on to say, God, let me go from there. 18, please. Oh, oops. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. Keep going. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. If you were here last Sunday evening, you'll have heard a wee bit about Melchizedek. But I just wanted you to see that because God has made us a promise. He's made us a promise that Jesus has gone ahead of us as our forerunner. He's made a promise that Jesus will come back to take us to be where he is. He's made a promise that that is secure, that we have eternal life through Jesus. And if you ever doubt it, know that God can't lie. God has promised it, and he cannot tell lies. It is yours. It's wonderful, wonderful news. Let's uh, pray together and just give thanks uh, for that. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and we praise you because you cannot lie. We praise you that you can't lie because you're good. We can't, you can't lie because you never do anything that's wrong, so you'll never knowingly lie. And Father, we also praise you that you can't lie because you're in complete control and so nothing can get in the way of you fulfilling what you have promised. Father in heaven, we praise you today and we thank you that your promises are all yes and amen. They're all sure to us in the Lord Jesus. And we thank you for that anchor that we have, that solid hope, that solid promise in heaven that we know that, we are, that you will fulfill your promise and take us uh, to be with you. Father, help us to put our hope in Jesus and to follow him always. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before the children go out to Sunday school, we're going to sing once again. Uh, God always keeps his promises. That's the opposite side. God can't lie. God always keeps his promises. And we'll stand as the music starts.
<laughs> All right, guys. Let's pray just before you go to Sunday school. Father God, we thank you that you do always keep your promises. And we ask that you would help us to get to know you better so that we trust you. And we ask that you would help us to get to know your promises better so that we know uh, what you have said. Father, please help the children as they go out to Sunday school. Help the adults as they stay here as well. Lord, please be with us. Uh, minister to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On you go, guys. So like I said, we're starting a new uh, series, uh, our Advent series, and we're going to be going slowly through John chapter 1, the first half of John chapter 1 even. Um, There's a a great theologian called Don Carson, and he once said, with John's gospel, you either have to fly through it or go really slowly. Um, And if you've been here a long time, as long as me, uh, you'll know that we went very quickly through John's gospel. And I remember I preached... John 1, 1 to 18 in one sermon. Does anyone remember? Must have been an alright one. Uh, John chapter 1, 1 to 18. Did it in a one, one, and it got the whole context. But what we're going to do through this Advent series, each Sunday and on Christmas Eve, we're going to go through just a few verses at a time and see the beauty of the Word become flesh and all, and a lot of, and just dwell and delight in all of that. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Ewan to come and read. Now, if you're using the blue church Bibles, it's on page 1063. Other one? Thank you. I've got a cough. Huh? I've got a cough. <laughs> We've both got a cough. Yeah, we do. Like Greg said, John chapter 1. Uh, We're reading the first 18 verses, but we'll just be looking at the first uh, three later on. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do praise you this morning that you have revealed yourself to us. Father, we thank you that you are a speaking God. You haven't been far off, but that you, uh, from the very beginning, from creation, have had a relationship with human beings. You've communicated with them, spoken to them. 
Father, we thank you for your word that you have given. We thank you for this inspired word that, that teaches us about who you are and all that you have done. Father, this morning and at this Christmas time, we particularly want to thank you for the gift of the Lord Jesus, for the Word made flesh. We thank you uh, that in Him you speak in such a much fuller way that He, that the perfect image of God, came into the world and lived. He walked and talked. He healed, challenged, became full of grace and truth. Father, we praise you for revealing yourself, not only through words, but through the Word of God, our Lord Jesus. We thank you that the Word became flesh, that that revelation was as complete as it could ever be. Father, we find it so hard to wrap our heads around the Incarnation. This idea that that the God of the universe, the eternal God, could be born as a baby in a stable in Bethlehem. Father, we ask that you would help us help us to, to sit in awe and wonder and delight in the coming of the Lord Jesus. Help us to understand it more. Help us to glory in it. And Father, as we prayed earlier on, we are so aware of, of the darkness and difficulties of people's lives. We pray, Father, for those in the church who are struggling just now, who feel like... Uh, like there's no joy and that there's no hope even although in their head they know that that's not true in their heart they feel heavy Father we pray that you would help us again as a a congregation of your people to gaze on the Lord Jesus and to see the joy and hope that he brings and Father we pray for the the world and particularly for for Yoker uh, Glasgow and Clyde Bank Lord, there is so much, uh, so much pain, so much suffering. And this year in particular, there's so much poverty, so much struggle. And Lord, we know that people seek to, to find comfort and solace in so many different things, many of which are, are very, very destructive. Father, we know that the only hope comes in the Lord Jesus. And we ask that you would help us to hold him out uh, to our friends and neighbours, to people that we speak to in the bus or in the shops. Lord, help us to be quick to speak of Jesus and the hope that he brings. And we pray that you would use all of our services through December and through our open day as well uh, to point people to the Lord Jesus. So, Father, please would you continue with us. Help you as he preaches this morning, as he opens up these verses to us, would you speak through him uh, to us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before Ewan comes to preach, we're going to stand and sing again. You're the word of God the Father.
Merry Christmas. Yeah. Huh? No, it's, we're in our Christmas series, which what normally happens is um, I get really festive at the start of December. That lasts for about two weeks. And then at the point where it would actually be appropriate to be Christmassy, I'm a wee bit fed up with it. <laughs> but that's fine. Um, who's put their tree up so far? Okay, a lot of you have a lot more restraint than I do. Um, who's watched a Christmas film? Who's listened to Christmas music? Who's listened to only Christmas music? Well done, Bob. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful time of year, Christmas, isn't it? Um, it is. Normally you agree with things like that. It's fine. Um, in the face of Christmas, we could respond in one of two ways. Okay? Christmas is a time that we associate with loads of different stuff, both in the church and out of the church. Uh, and there's really two ways that we can respond. We could either respond with awe or awe. Uh, let me explain again. We could either respond with awe, as in A-W-W, awe, like you might say if you saw something cute. You know, you see a baby climbing inside a stocking. Oh. Or you could respond with, oh, right? A-W-E. When you see something amazing that makes you go, wow. Can we practice those two responses? Okay. So if you saw something cute, you would go, oh, that was lovely. And if you saw something amazing, you would go, wow. Right, we've got a few things just to practice. Help us get this in our minds. Um, so how did, does this picture make you go, oh, or wow? Good, people decorating tree. Oh, this one, next. Big mountain, wow. Next one, wow. Next one, next one. Imagine if you saw that in person, right? You'd go, wow. Next one. Next one. Yeah, a bit of a mixed one, isn't it? See, we're sometimes not quite sure how to respond to Christmas. Um, there's, a, there's a part of it that makes us want to go, oh, that's nice. That's cute. It's a nice story about a baby and people together and there's animals and it's fuzzy and cute. And we like presents and stockings and decorations and sticking tinsel on stuff. But there's also a part of Christmas, isn't there, that calls us to reflect on who Jesus is, on the nature of who this man was who claimed to be both God and man. And that is something that should make each one of us filled with awe. We all face a choice, don't we? Uh, we can go along with the tinsel and the presence and the cozy feeling and act as if that is all there is. Or... At Christmas time, we have this particular opportunity to look at the truth about Jesus that Christians celebrate. There's, to be clear, there's nothing wrong with presents or decorating trees or ducklings or any of that cute stuff. But if we act like that is all there is to Christmas, all there is to life, then we are missing out on something that God has given for our good. John starts his gospel with one of the deepest, most profound passages in the whole Bible. If this is your very first time in church, you're very welcome. You have come in at the deep end. John's gospel, it's, it's a bit like if you went to a library, to a children's section, and picked out a My First Science book. And on page one, you saw a technical diagram for a space shuttle. Right? It's as if, bang in. He gives you the deepest, most intense theology he can that is difficult for us to wrap our heads around. It is. Uh, this passage should confuse us. If we go away from here thinking, yeah, I've pretty much understood John 1 perfectly, then we've not really looked at what the passage is saying. And so how should we respond as we read this passage? Well, I want to suggest that our response as we look at this um, should be to be in awe of what God is showing us. Uh, way back in the book of Exodus, in the Old Testament, in chapter 33, we get some idea of what we should be feeling. Moses has been talking to God for a while. He's seen God do incredible things. And at this place called Sinai, Moses finally says, 
Now, show me your glory. That is the response that we should have. As we look at this passage, we should want to see more of God's glory. Over the next few weeks, as we go through John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, we should grow in our desire to be awed. Because the danger is that if we're not awed by this, then we might have just settled for a kind of mediocre view of the world. See, all of us know that there are things wrong in our world, don't we? As we look around, as we see the news, as you just look at people, you see that there are so many problems. And we also, as humans, have this sense within us that there is some great truth out there. I think that's why things like conspiracy theories are so popular, because people want there to be something more, long for truth. As human beings, we're, we're hardwired to search for something greater. And as we look at those things, the, the darkness of our world and this longing for more, we sometimes come to the realization that we can't see everything or that we can't fix all the world's problems. And sometimes when we are faced with that, we settle for the kind of view of the world that we have. We often just kind of slump back and we content ourselves that the world is full of darkness, that we will be confused, that there will be times of sadness. Because of that, we try and distract ourselves with small things, uh, things that keep us busy, the kind of froth of life, the stuff that doesn't matter. Instead of looking for more. Maybe you're a Christian and you've experienced this. Maybe you've lost your desire for more. Maybe you find that you've settled into a comfy routine that you don't actually want to be challenged or changed by what you see. You're content to just plod along. But we are all faced with this choice as we come to John chapter 1. Will we settle for the things that make us go, aw, the stuff that doesn't really matter? Or will we strive to see more of this truth that should make us go, wow, I want us to see God's glory. And I want us to be amazed by what we see there. So if you have a Bible, please do open it up to John chapter 1. And in those first three verses, we are introduced to the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And at first, we might think, well, okay, I can understand that. I know what a Word is. I've read books before. I can understand a Word. But John then throws a spanner in the works for us by chapter, verse 2, saying, He was with God in the beginning. So we realize, actually, this word is not just a word on a page. The word is a person. A person that we maybe can know. A person who will have a personality. A person who will be so much more than just a word on a page. And it's true, isn't it, that words are how we know people. If you didn't have words, you would be limited in what you could know about any other person. Right? So there are things that you can tell about me just by looking at me. I'd prefer you didn't say them. But you can tell things about me by looking at me. But only a certain number, right? You're limited in how much you can know me if we never talk. If I never open my mouth and tell you things about me. Right? We would be limited. Words are how we get to know people. And here, in John chapter 1, we are told that there is a person who is God's word. If we want to know God, we have to go to his word, and his word is a person. Uh, let me rewind a wee bit to help us understand. Way back in Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of the Bible, God made the world. And as it's told in Genesis 1, where it's described that everything was empty and dark, there was absolutely nothing except God. Everything was chaos. And then God spoke. He spoke words. That was how everything began. It was by the word of God. And just by that act of speaking, God created everything. From darkness, he brought light. From chaos, 
he brought everything into order. John chapter 1 uses that same language, right? You'll notice that phrase, in the beginning, is a direct repeat from Genesis chapter 1. But in Genesis chapter 1, we, we followed the creation, right? We learned what God created on the first day, the second day, and then the story unfolded following what the creation did. In John chapter 1, we're told more about the words, those words that God spoke. Jesus. We are introduced to Jesus, who is God, and shows us what God is like. And again, we are faced with a choice. Do we respond by going, oh, well, that's nice, isn't it? Or do we look deep at what is being told us here about Jesus Christ and be awed by it? Because in Jesus, we have God on display. I want us to see three things about the Word from this passage. Three things that should help us to marvel at who He is. First thing, the Word is eternal. Look with me again at verses 1 and 2 and just appreciate the language of them. They are beautiful verses. Whether you are a Christian or not, I think it's difficult to ignore how wonderful this phrase is put together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. We are told there that the personal Word, the Word of God who is knowable, has always been around that there has never been a time when the Word was not. Look closely. Verse 1 does not say, in the beginning God made the Word, right? Nor does it say, in the beginning the Word arrived. No, it says, in the beginning was the Word. There was never a time before the Word. There was never a moment where the Word came into being. The Word has always been there. And if that doesn't make sense in your mind, good. It shouldn't. We shouldn't be able to properly grasp what that means. We are so bound in time that it's difficult for us to imagine anything that has just always been. But we are told here that the Word was. The Word is eternally existent. And this is really important as we come to look at Jesus later on that we see that he is not simply the first one that was created. He was there before creation. He was always there, always existing. The Word is eternal. Second thing that we see, the Word is equal to God. Now at first, the language of verse 1 should seem a bit strange to us, shouldn't it? Where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now those things don't fit together in our minds, do they? So if I said to you yesterday, I spent the day with Ewan. That doesn't make sense, does it? I am Ewan. Of course I spent my day with Ewan. That doesn't make sense, does it? Right? But here we are given both those statements together to help us grasp something of what God is like. And we need to see this, that if, if you take away either of those statements, we're not getting a full picture of who God is. Right? So if we, let me walk it through with you. If we weren't told that the Word was with God, we were only told that the Word was God, that would be simple, right? We'd just go, okay, the Word is God. Move on. I've understood. Box ticked. That's not a full picture. There is more to it than simply the Word being entirely equal to God. Because we are also told that the Word was with God. So imagine if you removed the Word was God, and we were only told the Word was with God. Well, then we would think uh, the Word is separate from God, right? Does that make sense? It's really, I find this really complicated and really difficult to wrap my head around. If we, ignore, <coughs> excuse me, if we ignore either of those two things that we are told about the Word, we will not get a picture of who He is. We will not get this kind of 
conundrum that we can't properly understand. What we have to see is that within God, there is a kind of plurality. So there is absolutely one God. That we are told from eternity. There has only ever been one God. But also within God, here from chapter 1, it, it, it's, there is God and then there is the Word and both are God. Right? Does anybody understand that fully? Liar. We shouldn't be able to get that. It goes beyond our comprehension that God would be one, but there would be multiple persons within God, but they are both fully God and they are separate from each other. Just if you try and draw it out, it doesn't make sense. But here in John, we are presented with it as the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And throughout church history, this has been one of the things that has led to the most misunderstandings. It's led to some of the most confused times as people try and wrap their heads around what this means. And generally, people, when they try and understand this, they can make the mistake of denying that Jesus is God, acting as though he, he must be something else because he is with God. So how can he also be God? Or people make the mistake of trying to mash the two together and keep not keeping the distinction that there is in John chapter 1 between the Word and God. Both of these miss out on the full picture that is being painted. So the Word is eternal. The Word is equal to God. Third thing, the Word is the uncreated creator. Look with me at chapter 1 verse 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. That verse makes it clear that it was Jesus who made everything. Uh, rewind with me back to Genesis chapter 1 that we spoke about a second ago. Where it was the word that brought life and light. Out of chaos, the word acted. God's word as he spoke acted to bring about creation. That is all we are being told here, isn't it? It's just that now the Word is also a person. The Word is a person that we can know. Um, I think this is just to help us understand that no creation happened except God's Word. It's almost just affirming what we hear in Genesis chapter 1 that there wasn't a kind of pre-creation where God made his word. No, his word was always there, and as it was spoken, creation happened. Again, this should go beyond our understanding. We shouldn't be able to grasp what exactly is going on. Instead, just marvel at what God is, has done. Because the word is God, and this is central to who he is eternally. This combination of Word and God. It means that the Word has always been a part of who He is. Um, let me try and help. Has anybody said something that they regret in their life? Yeah, we all have. We are all separable from our words, aren't we? So I have said things in the past that I now no longer agree with. I've said some really stupid stuff in the past that I'm ashamed of. I've spoken in ways that I would hate for anybody to find out. God is not like that. His word is not separable from him in that way. Instead, his word is and always has been key to who he is. Jesus is not an outflowing of God, his words expressed. He is God. This is... It is outstanding, isn't it? It is difficult for us to get our heads around. But here we have a picture of who Jesus has always been set in eternity. And it would be enough for us today just to stop and to marvel at who Jesus is. To reflect on those truths that we have seen of who he is and how he is both God and with God how he has always been the creator. 
But John takes this name, the Word, even further. As we see that Jesus has always been the eternal Word of God, united to Him, the one who created everything. Later on in this passage, John brings that name back and gives us good news to celebrate. So try, try and have all that we've looked at in your mind. Try and have the full weight of John's meaning of the Word in your mind. And then listen to verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. God, the Word, who is all this, from eternity, equal to God, uncreated Creator, He became human. He came down to be born as a human, to reveal God's glory. At way back in Exodus, as Moses asked to see God's glory, he was denied. God said, I will show you some of my glory, but you can't see my face. You can't see all of my glory. Because of your sinful state and because of how holy God is, Moses was not able. But here in John chapter 1, John says that Jesus the eternal Word of God, took on flesh. This is really important. When Jesus put on flesh, it wasn't just a costume, right? It wasn't as though He put on flesh like He was dressing up. No, as it says He became flesh, it means that He fully became human. He really did take on flesh like yours or mine. It means he came as a tiny little baby. A baby with everything that humans have. Armpits, nostrils, toes, everything. And it meant he had limitations as a human. Like a human, we're told Jesus got hungry. He got tired. He felt pain. He would have gotten sick, fallen over, all those things that humans do. Jesus did as he took on flesh. His nature remained fully God. He never lost his godness, but he also took on humanity in its fullness. Without division, both existed in the one person. It's as if he became 200%. His humanity was not lacking, his godness was not lacking. Both were together. He was still the Word who was with God and is God, the Creator now with a human nature. That is what it means for God to be with us, that He became like us. He took on human nature without abandoning His Godness. The Word became flesh so that we could know Him. And in that, He is more real than anything else we know in that He is more satisfying than anything else in creation. In Him there is nothing mediocre, nothing insubstantial, nothing disappointing. Everything about Jesus was fully there. And the truth as we look at that is that God sending His Son could be scary. Right? The idea that the eternal God who wouldn't show Moses' face because he knew it would destroy him in an instant, came down and took on human flesh, could scare us. Because we all know that we have fallen short of the mark that God has set. We all owe God. We should rightly fear His judgment. And as we read about the Word becoming flesh, there should be just a, a hint of fear as we go, what if God really does show us His glory? Because that glory would be awful for us to see in our sinful state. But here is where verse 14 assures us that we need not fear God becoming flesh. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus came in flesh full of grace. 
He came in that instant not to judge, but to make peace. And so the news that we can celebrate this Christmas is that if we have ignored God, rejected Him, He has come to bridge that gap. And actually His nature that we have talked about, that is a picture of what He does on the cross. That fully God, fully man nature that Jesus took on Himself shows us the work that He was doing on the cross. As He wipes away the stain of sin, He makes it possible for humanity to be brought together with God. Jesus' nature should amaze us. But what is even, but what is even more is that it is a picture of what He has done for us. Right? Jesus... Jesus being both God and man is not just a truth that we struggle to wrap our heads around. It is a reality that he brought to each one of us. An assurance that God and mankind can be brought together by his power. Maybe you're aware that you have been distracting yourself. That you have been ignoring this truth that actually you have been settling for things that entertain you but don't satisfy your deepest itch to know the truth, to see more of who God is. Jesus took on flesh so that you could see His glory. And we can come before Him and awe at who He is, what He has done. Maybe today, you feel overwhelmed with the darkness. Maybe as you look out at the world, especially at Christmas time, you see so much sadness and brokenness in our world. Well, come to the one who puts the light of his glory on display. The eternal God who put on flesh like yours so that you could know him. Maybe you're facing confusion and uncertainty. Come to the one who created this world, who holds it together, and who offers you peace. Maybe you're living with sadness. Come to the word who is God, the one who satisfies completely. This Christmas, we will all have ample opportunity to distract ourselves. We will all face countless hours of Christmas films, Christmas music, decorating things. There is nothing wrong with them. But if that is all Christmas is, you are missing out on this truth about who Jesus is. As we go through this section of John, I want us to think about the very Word of God who took on flesh so that you could know Him and be awed by who Jesus is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that Jesus is. And Lord, though it is difficult and impossible for us to fully understand what it means for Jesus to be with God and to be God, for him to be both fully God and fully man, we ask that you would help us just to marvel at that to stand back and be amazed at what your word teaches us he is. Lord, we're sorry for those times when we have distracted ourselves, when we've settled for far too little. We ask that you would help us to seek to be awed, like Moses, to ask to see more of your glory. Lord, we pray this Christmas time you would show us Jesus and all that he means for us. We ask this in his precious name. Amen. Amen. We're going to finish with a Christmas carol that simply stands back and marvels at this truth that is at the heart of Christmas. That simply looks at who Jesus is and celebrates that. Uh, So can we stand as the music starts and we'll sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
stick around for tea and coffee and just encourage each other with that truth about Jesus. Uh, We'll finish with these words from 2 Corinthians. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.